Okay, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Angelica Strohmeyer, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna present this paper that I co-authored with Mary Lang from uh, School of Social Science at Northumbria University, and Rob Comer, who is also like me from Open Lab at Newcastle University. Um, I'm gonna structure this talk in kind of three sections. If I've not followed exactly the structure of the paper, um, but I just wanna give you kind of the important bits and things and pieces. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about um, sex, sex work, and HCI, um, and then explain the case study that I was working with with a national charity called National Ugly Mugs in the UK, um, before I then go into detail of how digital technologies can support the mediation of social justice within the space. Um, so to start um, addressing sex work in HCI, so um, there isn't that much work going on in this space, but there's lots of interesting things around sex and social justice in HCI, so that's kind of where I'm coming from, as well as sex work research and social science research from that space. But to start, I want to I wanna start with this quote from Juno Mack, who is a sex worker rights advocate and um, activist in the UK. Uh, if you care about gender equality or poverty, or migration, or public health, then sex worker rights matter to you. And I'd argue that in HCI, in ICT4D, we do these things. We look at equality, we look at poverty, we look at migration, we look at public health, and we look at all of these things from different perspectives. So why don't we look at sex worker rights within that space? So sex work has lots of different definitions, and there are lots of academic definitions, there's lots of activist acti uh, definitions and legal definitions, and I'm happy to talk about in de those in detail afterwards, but for the sake of kind of a short talk, um, I see sex work as the exchange of sexual services for pay and all genders buy and sell these services. Um, so it's great to see that there's a social justice session at CHI and it's fantastic to see it and they've given it kind of the importance of this massive room where I can't even really see anything. Um, and it kind of shows that there's a growing body of work around social justice. Um, which is really, really fantastic, but what I think is sometimes missing a little bit is the theoretical implications of this and kind of what, is, what does social justice actually mean and what are those kind of things that we talk about. So last year at DIS, uh, Linda Mrofsky, Ellie Harmon, and Sarah Fox uh, wrote Social Justice Oriented Interaction Design, um, which asks important questions around the definitions of social justice and the ways in which we can research and design to move towards a horizon that is socially just. So I use this orientation in the paper and couple it with kind of sex work research and sex worker rights advocacy. So in HCI, like I said, there is very little work that addresses sex work directly, but there's some stuff on pornography. Uh, within that work, it usually focuses on the modes of consumption rather than seeing it as a sex working issue. Um, at the same time, there is literature around positive sex and sexuality, putting women's pleasure at the center and kind of finding playful interactions around sexuality. Um, but when it comes to sex work and sex labor, it, things start to become more around tracking and health and health information, information dissemination. Um, so this opens up a space for us to take into consideration the self-efficacy of sex workers, political concerns of the sex worker rights movement, relational models and, and approaches to research and design, and the engagement of sex workers of all genders rather than just focusing on women. So with this paper, we hope to integrate an interdisciplinary literatures and move the conversation around sex work into the space of social justice, contextualizing it uh, with sex work debates in multifaceted and multidimensional lenses of justice. Um, that's kind of a, a big thing, and I'll try to break it down through the case study um, that I did with National Ugly Mugs. Um, so their mission statement is fighting stigma, saving lives, hence that bit in my title. Um, and it's also to end violence against sex workers. So the name, if you don't know very much about sex work, might be a bit odd. Um, so ugly mugs are reports that, are start, that were allegedly started in the 1980s in Australia by the Prostitutes Collective. That was kind of sex workers would write little notes on pieces of paper and share them, anonym, share them among their friends and peers and coworkers to warn them of dangerous perpetrators or, or allegedly dangerous perpetrators and situations. Um, this was then picked up by local service providers who kind of collated this information and turned it into booklets and flyers to share with their service users. And then in the UK, after years and years of, adv of advocacy work, the Home Office, uh, which is kind of the uh, Interior Affairs Ministry, um, funded a national scale of this kind of service, which is National Ugly Mugs. Um, so they use digital technologies to mediate 
this exchange of notes on a national scale. So in the sense, the digital technology has made it possible to expand this very informal, very fragmented process to a national scale, um, and arguably from a purely technological perspective, a global scale. Um, so yeah, um, I've been working with NUM since around December 2015, and my work with them is ongoing. Um, but for this, for this paper, I'm just going to talk about um, findings from these uh, methods. So my methodology is inspired um, by social justice-oriented interaction design, as well as sex worker feminist um, literatures. So I've, um, I engage in all of these different methods with NUM members. So the surveys and interviews were done with direct members who were either sex workers or staff from um, other services that provide other charities that provide services for sex workers. And then I carried out two creative workshops during drop-in sessions with street-based sex workers who receive the alerts from NUM through kind of a third-party member. Um, so this reporting and alerting process, I've got a thick description of how all of that works in, like, from, the, from the methods in the paper, um, focusing on reporting, alerting, and mobilization practices. But here I just want to briefly walk you through the process and how it works. So once a, me once a member, a sex worker uh, is able to report a crime that has been committed against them through the website by filling out a form. Um, they do this, um, this form was designed by a team made of, of NUM staff, researchers, and serious crime se um, section from the police. So and under reporting of crimes committed against sex work is a massive, massive issue. Um, and although it's improved by NUM practice, um, there are still certain crimes committed against the people that I talked to and had surveys from that are not necessarily seen as crimes, but rather as almost hazards of the job. Um, for, so for example, verbal abuse. Um, but these crimes need to be reported, and they are crimes. Verbal abuse is a crime, um, and should be reported. So any future developments in that space should kind of try to take into account not only the legal crimes, but also the things that are seen as, oh, so he was just a jerk, it's fine. Um, and these kind of things exist in uh, online forums that sex workers engage with anyway, um, but there are reasons for potentially including it in service delivery more, in more detail. But once this report has been made, uh, NUM staff are notified and enter, into, enter the information into databases. Um, then depending on the consent given by the person that made the report, this information is then either shared with police, shared anonymously with police, or not shared with police. And there it's very important um, and a large reason of why NUM is so trusted is that there is this anonymization process going on and there is this very trusted relationship that exists. So from this, staff then create alerts, which are just short texts um, from the information given by uh, the person that made the report. So this includes kind of information on the location of, of the event, information about the alleged perpetrator, and descriptions of the crime that was committed. Um, after this report uh, is turned into the alert, these are shared with the sex workers who are members, as well as the other charities that are members of NUM. Um, sorry, NUM National Ugly Mugs is shorter, it's a bit easier. Um, this is done via email, SMS, um, and through the NUM website directly. <coughs> sorry. Um, so there's this kind of sharing on a national scale going on, but it only goes to the location or the area within the location that the crime was committed, unless there's a traveling um, alleged perpetrator then it's shared nationally. Um, what became particularly interesting, however, when asking about the alerting practices was that it was made particularly clear that no matter, no matter how the alerts were shared, whether it was through these technologies or even through um, kind of pin boards in the charities where they print out the alerts for people who are not members, um, that these were invaluable to sex workers. And they are an example of information and communication practices and experiences and a means of addressing social justice concerns in and of themselves. Um, so NUM members file reports as an act of solidarity among sex workers and to warn others. So it's not necessarily only about um, getting the social and criminal justice for themselves, but also to warn others in solidarity for protecting the community, um, which in turn makes everyone involved in the alerting process. So everyone from the person writing the report to the person receiving the alert feel safer. Um, and as part of that, that in itself is almost a mobilization practice. So it's almost a way in which the charity mobilizes their members to become advocates or to become 
um, activists in some way. Um, NUM themselves are, do other things for mobilization practices in kind of fragmented as well as centralized ways through social media, through policy documentation, through research, um, through writing newspaper and magazine articles for online and in paper publications. Um, but there's more information on that in the paper itself. For now, um, I want to focus on kind of the digital mediation of social justice within this space. Um, so there are detailed examples and kind of a thick description and data from everything I've just said in the paper. So if you're curious, please do have a look at that. Um, but I want to look at kind of implications for design. And I'm, I'm using that... Um, in a, in a way that's not just about pragmatic design in itself, but also ethos of design and research within that space. Um, so these implications are based on the work that I've done and are rooted in a social justice-oriented framework, contextualizing interdisciplinary debates in these multidimensional spaces of justice. Um, so I first talk about, I'm going to talk about the ethos behind, that I think, the ethos behind designing technologies with and for sex workers and support services through technologies for harm reduction. Then I'll talk about the types of technologies that could be used when working within this harm reduction framework and ethos in mind, advocating kind of for the power in the mundane and simplicity. Um, and lastly, I'll then talk about the wider implications for advocacy of these, of these technologies. Um, that we design going beyond immediate effects and practice, which in this case is the fighting of stigma. <clears throat> so when designing technologies for sex workers and sex work support services, we need to ensure that they are designed in such a way that they give agency to the sex workers and must ensure that they are in accordance with evidence-based public health practices and approaches. Raycart, um, for example, argues that through this kind of approach, supportive environments with reduced harm can lead to improved life quality and subsequently empowerment of the sex workers. Raycart wrote this model more than 11 years ago, and in their model, this leads to the exiting um, of the sex worker from the industry. But 11 years later, and when applying a sex-positive feminist and social justice approach to this, to this model, um, uh, we, we kind of argue that the developing of technologies that would enable this kind of harm reduction, as outlined by Raycart, would enable sex workers to continue doing the work that they do in a safer and harm-reduced, non-judgmental and supportive way. Um, looking at NUM service delivery, the most obvious form of this harm may be associated with violence. Looking at literature, it's, uh, it's around health, but we also need to consider things around privacy. Um, and issues of centralized and trusted intermediaries in relation to this privacy. So we kind of want to continue this discussion on harm reduction by exploring the types of technologies that could be useful to uh, develop uh, within this harm reduction space. We do this by arguing for the power in the mundane. So many sex workers use NUM services because they want to receive the alerts via SMS, email, or through the website. And those are really mundane technologies, but they're really useful. Um, so sex workers are marginalized from society um, and often very stigmatized. They've been systematically left out of, for example, LGBT rights history, as well as debates on the legality of their own work, um, especially, and also feminist debate on the morality of the work that they do. But the personal and felt security and safety that comes through this mundane technology of these alerts and uh, through email and SMS, help reduce that in a roundabout way. So, sorry. Um, yeah, so the mundane technology itself is a social justice outcome since it is part of how this marginalization and oppression impact the experiences and practices with the technology. In this case, sex workers are utilizing these mundane technologies to reduce their marginalization and oppression by working together with the charity to create spaces where they are enabled to do the work that they do in a supportive, harm-reduced, improved quality of life and empowered way. For many, the reporting and alerting practices is the first time that sex workers who have been abused can say something about this abuse in an anonymous, respected, and non-judgmental way. And that is a huge thing. As such, small changes to the materiality of these technologies, such as the way the alerts are shared, the way the mailing lists are set up, uh, or even just the titles of the alerts themselves, could lead not only to social, but also criminal justice and policy outcomes. 
In instances such as these examples, it becomes the role of the HCI researcher to be a critical friend in the space, in the process of, of the interpretation of the data, commenting on current technology use, and developing implications of both of these to further social and criminal justice goals of sex workers and support services, making sure to have an introspective and ethical approach to this. So this leads us to kind of talk about the wider implications of all of this. So while mundane technologies and technologies for harm reduction have the potential to have direct social justice um, kind of impacts, one area that, that necessarily doesn't directly address um, is stigma. So NUM's aim is to end violence against sex workers, and they argue that they do this, at least in part, through the reduction of stigma. So looking more specifically at the ways in which they approach their activism, it becomes clear that they engage in fragmented and centralized practices. So through the alerting process, either through fragmented online forums, partially centralized through charities who are um, members of NUM or in completely centralized processes through NUM directly, the reporting um, and the reporting process affect immediate change in individuals' perceptions of safety as well as practice. Um, but when looking all the, at the ways in which they communicate with others uh, politically, we see that their change in individuals' perceptions go beyond the immediate. Fighting for policy change, developing good practice guidance for service provision, and various online and in-person campaigns to reduce stigma. So as researchers, this means that any design we come up with should have social justice effects on multiple levels, immediate practical implications, wider contextual implications, and intangible effects in relation to stigma. With this, I mean that we take into account the fragmented and centralized aspects of the work that we research and, the re and really understand the context that we're working within to strive to become that critical friend that I was talking about earlier. As such, the technologies should aim to reduce harm and fight stigma, while also aiding in the wider movement towards a more socially just world, creating a space designers should strive to innovate within. This means we need to engage in conversations and reflections um, surrounding risks and affordances of technologies. Um, and various, including various stakeholders within that conversation, really. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much to my co-authors and for listening, and especially NUM staff for the collaboration and the relationship that we have together. Thank you. Hello, uh, Connor Kelly from UW, uh, University of Washington. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, at what frequency do these sex workers have access to the ICT, te um, ICT technology uh, necessary for, for this sort of intervention? Um, and, uh, and on top of that, how do, we, how do we reach those that don't? Okay, so you're asking kind of the access of technology from, for sex workers. N yes. Uh, so I, I can only really talk about the UK and kind of Western context within this, because I don't know that much about um, spaces outside of that. Um, but there is this understanding that a lot, a lot of sex work happens on the street with people who have very chaotic lives, and that definitely is happening, and they probably don't have very much access to kind of smartphones and that kind of thing, because uh, phones are sometimes even seen as kind of as currency. But a large, uh, a really large portion of sex workers are, um, have ready access to any kind of technology. Um, there's research that shows um, one in five students, for example, in the UK have thought about doing sex work. Um, so it is a, it, I mean, in this room here, statistically speaking, um, there will be some sex workers. So um, access is for certain populations definitely an issue. Uh, for a lot, of a lot of parts of the population, not so much an issue. Um, about getting technology to those where it is an accessibility issue, um, it's kind of the same as every group that doesn't have access to technologies. Um, I don't really have an answer for that, um, but a part of it is just infrastructuring as well. So it's about price of technologies and infrastructures that are available. So to be able to use the service, um, if you don't have access to technology, you can go to a, to a service who is a member of the charity and report to them in person, and then they will fill out the form online for them. So there are practices in, space, in place to allow for people who don't have access to technology to gain access to the service. Thank you. That's all right. 